I'd, I'd, I'd generally like to start with a question, and the question we're going to start with in some ways is review, because you've been through half the course, but I want to go back to the beginning. You know, what makes science different from other ways of knowing? And I'm asking you, we're going to make a list. What makes science different from other ways of knowing? I mean, why are we bothering with this course? Why not just take another history course? What do you think? Okay, experiment. What else? I'm going to put it in the plural. Do, do, other, do other fields not, not develop hypotheses? Some do. So that doesn't make science unique, does it? Well, when we say, you know, a way of knowing, what do we start with? Do we start with a hypothesis? A problem. So let's talk about a process. And that's what I mean by way of knowing, a process. We start with a problem, or well, we start with a question, right? And then what do we do? Well, you've already put it here. We, 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 we come up with some guesses, right? Maybe good guesses. You know, one through x. Could be more than one. Then what do we do? If it's science, we test it. And a test could be an experiment. Though it may just be observation. How do we know whether the test, how, how do we decide whether the test allows us to move forward? Well, yeah, I, I agree, but let's assume, you know, we're really good at this. We're going to be accurate. Certainly we're going to record the data, but are all tests equal, do you think? Well, we could do, it has to be repeatable, sure. How would we know if it's repeatable? Maybe this seems like splitting hairs. We need to be, be able to make, go ahead. OK, if someone else can do it, but we need to be able to make predictions, don't we? If we can't make predictions, it doesn't matter what our hypothesis is. I mean, repeatability depends on your ability to make predictions. OK, so we make predictions. We do a test. Maybe it's an experiment. And hopefully that will allow us to do what? To a conclusion. Well, what does that mean, though? Well, yeah, we could solve the problem, but let's go back to the hypotheses. Or wrong, right? Generally, what we do is we, we dump hypotheses. We cross them off the list. That is, we reject. More than one. Maybe we leave one. That makes us think that one might be right. How is this different from other ways of knowing? Everybody asks a question and tries to solve a problem. And everybody develops hypotheses. But this part, the testing and the ability to make predictions, 
That's unique to science. If you can't make predictions, it's not science. That means there are limits. I mean, there are some ways of knowing where, you know, we say, well, we think this is why it's happening, but we can't make any predictions about it. And that's okay. It's just, it's not science. I'll show you my outline. You know, we'd go on from that. I mean, maybe it's a really com complicated problem. We might reject some hypotheses or revise the hypotheses we have, then make predictions and test them again. But, and maybe this isn't necessary. I want to dissuade you from the idea that science is just a collection of facts, because it's not. You know, we had you buy a book, but you know what? What's in that book's gonna change. You know, what's in that book isn't science. It, this is the process, it's the process that's science. And I want you to see how this works, so we're gonna do an experiment. So let me tell you about this. Actually, we need to ask some other questions. I wanna ask, what do all living things do? And, and more particularly, I wanna ask, what's the most important activity? for any living organism. We're going to make another list. I like lists. But you're going to tell me what they are. What do living things do? They reproduce. What else? Well, yes, but that's not something a living thing does. That's something that's, that's a consequence of not living, isn't it? I mean, living things don't intentionally die, do they? I agree. Let's talk about living processes. Okay. What else? Consume energy. Let's say it energy processing. I mean, we could put it differently. I mean, for, for all living things, it's, it's assimilating energy, right? I mean, if it's you or me, we're eating food. If we're talking about a green plant, we're talking about absorbing sunlight. Energy is a problem. That's why we have to use a, a ridiculous word like assimilation. Because you can't make or destroy energy, right? What else? What else do living things do? Well, it's more than energy, so we'll put it as, as eat. It's, it's about matter. I mean, living things need more than energy. They need matter, too. They consume matter. What else? Breathe. That's part of this. Gas exchange. But you realize the only reason that you need to breathe is so that you can process energy. There's nothing special about it. It's about processing energy. What else? Well, how did you all get here today? Yes. What else? Oh, look, if, if I had a little time machine, and I've always thinking about time machines, because I, I don't know, that appeals to me somehow. We, we could go back 10 years, and you would not all look the way you do today. So how is it that you look different now than you did 10 years ago? Hmm? Well, it is aging, but what's actually happening? And if I went back 20 years, well, some of you would be alive. Maybe. We have a name for it. It's not just getting bigger. Look, 10 years ago, none of you were able to grow beards. OK. We have a name for that. 
we call it development. It's not just getting bigger, but it's changing. All living things do that too. Which of these is most important, do you think? Pardon me? You think we're producing? You all think that? No. <laughs> you think just getting bigger is the most important process? It's true that growth and, 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 and maturation are really important, although despite my having said that, there are some living things that exist as single cells and they don't grow at all. I mean, the cell may get a little larger. They don't differentiate in any way. The cell always looks like just one cell. So it's possible to be alive without much of this or with very little of it. But without reproduction, you wouldn't have any living things, would you? They, now, these things are all true. Y you've made a good list. Certainly, reproduction is very important. We're going to focus on that. Today, we're going to focus on it by asking another question. We're going to work with an organism, an insect, um, that I call a bean beetle. This is its scientific name, Calisabrucus maculatus. It's a tropical pest insect that I'm able to raise in the lab. And I want to tell you a little bit about its life cycle and its behavior, and then we'll consider the question that we're going to address. This is what they look like. The sexes are really easy to tell. This is a female. This is a male. You're seeing them on a, this is magnified, of course. It's on a millimeter grid. So they're not really very large, but they're not microscopic. Females, you can tell because on the back of the abdomen, I mean, these are insects. You know, insects all have the same organization. Head, thorax, abdomen. Thorax is right here. That's where the legs are coming out. Here's the abdomen. At the very back of the abdomen, two black stripes, light in the middle. That tells you it's a female. The males tend to be smaller. And they tend to be brownish in color, where the females are blackish. But that's not the best character. The best character is the very back of the abdomen. It's uniform in color, no black stripes. You tell that difference, you've got the sexes. The beetles are not unlike most other animals. Fertilization's internal. The male's got to copulate with the female. He transfers sperms to the female. Insects do other things, too, besides sperms. He transfers uh, nutrients to the female with each insemination. It's not trivial. It could amount to 5% of his body mass with each copulation. You know, that's like hacking off an arm and giving it to your date. And after she's fertilized, she'll store sperms, and she can just then fertilize her eggs. And they lay eggs on different bean species, dried beans, like black-eyed peas and mung beans and azuki beans. So this is the life cycle. There's a female. We know because she's got those two black stripes, the back of the abdomen. And she lays eggs on those beans. Initially, they look sort of clearish. That's where the arrow is. As they get older, an embryo develops and burrows right into the bean. It has, they, they have a larva stage, a larval stage that looks like a caterpillar. But you never see it crawling around because it burrows right into the bean. And it chews its way through the bean to get all its nutrition. So initially, when it, when it goes into the bean, it's kicking its waste back into the egg, and the egg becomes whitish in color. So there's the lava. You can see it. It's sort of it's like a maggot. That's what we'd call it, a maggot. And it's chewing its way through the bean. Here it is removed. That's its mouth there. After a period of time, oh, maybe 20 days or so, depending on the temperature, 
less than that. In, in about somewhere between three and four weeks, that lava burrows up near the surface. And you can see it's near the surface because it's cleared an area. So th there's a beetle right below that little window. And it undergoes the metamorphosis. You know, just like a butterfly goes and undergoes the metamorphosis. You know, you've got a caterpillar, and then you're going to get an adult. The beetles do the same thing. They undergo a metamorphosis. This is the pupal stage that's undergoing that metamorphosis. That's an older pupa. And then it comes out. It cuts its way out of the bean and comes out as an adult, ready to start again. The adults don't eat. The adults don't eat. They get all the nutrition from the bean as a larva. And the adults don't live very long. The adults live maybe 7 to 10 days. So all they're doing when they're out there as adults, they're copulating, they're laying eggs. So again, the beetles get all the nutrition from the bean. So you know, this leads to some obvious issues. The, probably the most important decision a female bean beetle makes is where to lay her eggs. Because that determines all the nutrition that her offspring are going to get for their entire life. Because they don't feed. They don't feed as adults. So the question is, where should she lay her eggs? But we'll refine it a little more. We want to ask, really, do female bean beetles exhibit preferences? for egg laying. And we could ask it, I mean, I'm asking sort of a series of questions here, but we're going to refine it down to one. You could ask, how does the environment influence her reproduction? You know, there are all kinds of beans out there in nature. And there are other things that aren't beans. She's got to choose between them if she's going to get offspring into the future. So this is the question I want us to address. Simple one, in some ways. Do bean beetles prefer to lay eggs on large beans? That's the question I want us to focus on. We have to decide what the hypotheses are. You can see I've written two things up there, null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis. Let's start with the null. What does that mean, null hypothesis? What do you think? Have you never heard of this before? Good, good, louder. No conclusive decision? OK, but how about with respect to our question? Do female bean beetles prefer large beans? What would the null hypothesis be for that question, do you think? OK, they don't. We would say no preference. Um, we could actually say no preference for bean size. Generally, the null hypothesis is the hypothesis of no, no interaction or no, I mean, you're right in some sense, you know, your comment, well, some do, some don't. Well, that means it's random, right? The null hypothesis is typically the hypothesis of no interaction, no relationship. You know, if we had some idea, we could ask the question, maybe a trivial question, you know, who can jump the highest? And we might think, well, 
you know, we might look at how tall the person is, how heavy the person is, but the null hypothesis would be there's no difference between people and in their ability to jump. There's no relationship between the characteristics we might measure and their ability to jump. That would be the null hypothesis. So if this is a reasonable null, we could have more than one alternative hypothesis, but we've got to have at least one. So I'll say alternative hypotheses. Typically, we'll abbreviate, abbreviate the null as H0. And our first alternative will be H sub 1. So what do you think? What, what should an alternative hypothesis be? OK. Prefer what? Large beams. Large beams. Is there another alternative? Yeah, they, they prefer small beams. That's good. That's a good collection of hypotheses. OK, so we need to answer some more questions about how we're going to do this. Now, this may seem strange to you, but I don't have a recipe for you. I don't. I don't have a recipe for you. We're going to decide together today how we're going to do this. So I've written down what I think are some of the questions we need to address to be able to design the experiment. This was in your notes, in the handout. We need to decide what are we going to manipulate, and what are we going to keep constant, and how many times we're going to repeat it, and what are we going to measure or, or count? Then we'll come back to the hypotheses, because we need to make some predictions. Let me tell you about uh, the materials that we've got. Okay, I've got beetles on live beetle cultures here on two kinds of beans, black-eyed peas and adzuki beans. And I've got 60 millimeter dishes, which are a good way to keep beetles confined. You can think of this as a potential experimental unit. And I've got supplies of azuki beans and black eyed peas that the beetles have never seen before. And although I haven't personally gone through these, the beans are not all exactly the same size. Which is to say, if we went into these, we could sort them out. Some of these are larger, some of them are smaller. Same thing with the black-eyed peas. They're not all exactly the same size. Now clearly, these are two different species of beans. And they are different in size as well. So the first question, what should we manipulate? Bean size. How do you think we should do that? How should we put this? We, we could say present. Who are we going to present beans of different sizes to? To the beetles. To females. Or at least to females. What do you think the category should be? I mean, we can make it simple. Large and small.
What should we keep constant? I guess I haven't told you enough. We have an incubator that is kept at 30 degrees Celsius. That's warmer than room temperature. The beetles love it. They can go through their life cycle in, in three weeks, but we don't need them to do that because they'll lay eggs in 24 hours for us. I mean, I mean, I can tell you up front, we'll be able to collect data on Wednesday. That's how fast they'll start laying eggs. So we can, we can put them in the incubator at 30 degrees. Um, so what sort of things are we going to keep constant? OK. May I interpret that? Bean type is the species, at least within a given experiment. What else should we keep constant? Someone else. Temperature, OK. What else should we keep constant? What, what, OK, the, the container. So you're going to all use the same size container? What else? What's going to go into the dish? The number of beans. So how many beans are going to go into a dish? I mean, here, here's the experimental unit. What's going to go in there? Say it again. OK, how many? How many? Four of each? Four total? OK, here's the problem. I mean, I think it's reasonable we're going to put some Small beans in and large beans. I have to reveal some more. One beetle, one female beetle could lay 100 eggs. And here's the problem. You know, the beetles are, you know, they're not that different from us. You know, if you are really hungry, you might feel that, you know, your favorite restaurant is Friendlies. If you're from the Northeast, you know what I'm talking about. Friendlies might be your favorite place. But you know what? If you drive into a town and you show up at the Friendlies and there's a line going out the door and you're famished, you'll go somewhere else. What does that have to do with beetles? If they run out of places to lay eggs, they'll lay eggs on anything. So putting one bean of each type in there might be fine if you're right there at the moment that she lays that first or second egg. But if once she runs out of choices, well, you won't know. You won't know what she preferred. OK? So I'm going back to this. How many beans of each type? This is a good design. How many beans of each type? Four may not be enough. She's got 100 eggs to lay. <laughs> I'm sorry? Well, you could easily get 30 in here of either species. You tell me. Oh, and here's the other side of this, OK? Whatever you put in there on Wednesday, you're going to have to inspect individually. Each bean you're going to have to inspect under a dissecting microscope. Now, that's not difficult to do, but in other words, if you were proposing that we put 50 beans in each dish, which could fit, well, that means you're going to have to count all of those. That is, you're going to have to look at every one of those. You think 20 total? I'm Let's boost, let's, it, if you focus on it, what, like 10 seconds? Well, now, 
No, but it's not from all the lies. Is he talking? Yeah. No, I mean, he went to oh, me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we didn't say you had to put them all in one dish. You know, you could, you know, if you're saying that you're going to keep constant the bean type, you could do your experiment one bean species at a time. That's okay. You're saying 28. You could do, you could do 14 and 14. That's okay. So what should it be? 30 total. So 15 of each. What else is going to go in here? Just the female? How many beetles? Okay, but we can't know, although I, I can tell you, usually a female gets copulated really quickly after she emerges. But you want to make sure she's got sperms. You say one female and two males? We can do it that way. How many of these dishes should we do? No, the whole class. We're, we're going to pool all our data. How many dishes should we do? Well, look, we, we, I thought we agreed we were going to keep bean type constant in a given experiment. Now, we could do two separate experiments. That's up to you. But for a given experiment, I'm asking, how many of these dishes should we do? This is the question of replication. OK, let me ask the question differently. Look, if I wanted to know what's the height of a Morehouse man, how many Morehouse students should I pull off the street and measure? I mean, what if I just went out the door of Hope Hall and the basketball team was walking by? Well, you know, I could pull five or even 10 people, and I'd, I'd have some crazy idea about the height of a Morehouse man. Wouldn't I? So, how many of us are there here? Two, four, six, eight. There are 10 of us. How about if you each do two? 20 is a reasonable number. 10 might be too few. But 100 is too many. Two apiece? But let me say that the dishes you do don't count for very much. Two replicates isn't, it won't tell you anything. In fact, is you're going to get some duds. You may get a dish where, here's the problem. You know, we, we've all agreed we're going to put a female in and two males. We have no idea how old that female is. It may be a female who just emerged, and thank goodness we've got two males in there so that she gets copulated. Or she may be a female who just laid her 100th egg, and she's just about to die. We don't know their ages. We don't know whether that female is two days old or nine days old. It's going to make a difference. So we need to have that replication to ensure that we get enough, enough dishes where we really get something that we can look at. There could be some duds. Duds are, you know, you don't get any leg, eggs laid at all. You don't have any data to collect. So your own dishes count for not much. The data set that we collect as a whole is what we're interested in. So what are we going to measure? We're going to put, we're going to put 15 of each in the dish. Is that what we're going to measure? OK, so we're going to count the eggs laid.
We'll do this on Wednesday. We'll count the eggs that were laid on Wednesday. We have one more step. I said earlier on that we have to be able to make predictions, don't we? So we need to go back to our, our, our hypotheses and decide what we predict if each hypothesis were the correct hypothesis. Given this experimental design, this is a, this is a reasonable design. So if the null hypothesis was true, what do we predict? for the results of our experiment. What's the prediction? So I mean, I think you're on the right track. I mean, we're we're hypothesizing no preference. So do you, do you predict there's going to be more, beans, more eggs on one kind of bean than the other? Same amount on both size beans. Is that right? Okay. What's the prediction of females prefer large beans? Edward, what do you think? Yeah, if, what if she, if, if, if this hypothesis is the correct hypothesis, what do we predict the outcome will be? Where will, how will the egg, what will the pattern of egg laying be? That's what we're asking. On? If she prefers large beans? But if she prefers large beans, where do you think she's going to lay? You think she's going to lay fewer eggs on large ones? Ah, OK. So the prediction here would be more eggs on large beans than small beans. What if this prediction's right? There, what if this hypothesis is true, that she prefers small beans? There'd be more eggs in small beans. Now there's one more little bit here. You know, we've got two species of beans. We could do the experiment on just one species, or we could do two separate experiments on two species. That's up to you. But we should start with one. Which species do you want to start with? Black-eyed peas? OK. Do you, do you want to do the experiment on the other ones as well? So that'll mean everyone does four dishes, two on this and two on this. It, no, that'll be easy. Why? Well, these are a lot bigger beans than these. I mean, small ones of these are probably bigger than the big ones of these. Because they're two different species. And so they may have different qualities that have nothing to do with size at all. That's why we're talking about keeping bean species or bean type constant. We don't want that to confound the experiment. I mean, it may well be that the beetles prefer one species over the other. But that's separate from the question of which, you know, do they prefer large beans? Should we do both then? 
Yeah. One more issue. One more issue. Look, you're going to sort the beans out. I mean, before you even go and get beetles, you've got to sort the beans out. You've got to have the largest, you know, 15 large beans and 15 of the smallest beans of a given species to go into that dish. Should we quantify what large and small means? How could we measure that? I've got some balances, very sensitive balances here. We If, if you want to do length, I've got vernier calipers that I can pull out. Which one's easier? Well, you could take all 15 beans of a given size. In other words, your 15 small beans, you could put them all into a little dish and weigh it. And, have, and, and you'd know the average size of your small ones. Do the same thing for your large ones. Or you could measure each one individually. <laughs> Is that Simo? I mean, it's not as precise as weighing each bean individually. But you know, I'm counting on you really sorting them out so that it's a fair experiment. So there are two balances. The way these work is, well, when you're ready to weigh them, I can show you, OK? But they are very sensitive. So I ask that you not directly touch the weigh plate. When I say sensitive, these will weigh to four decimal places of a gram. So we'll get a pretty good idea of what those beans weigh. What you're going to want to do is start out by getting the beans, sorting them out, OK? Questions? Let's do it.